It's Thursday. We're live. Welcome to Frankly Speaking, where truth is our mission, rally our realm, set as we see it, and frankly as well. Joe Spring along with Paul Crowley. How you doing, Joe? You're looking very well. But by the way, why do people critique you because you chew a little gum once in a while? You Some know? people have... <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's getting picky, isn't it? It's getting really picky. No, Paul. you know, I shouldn't be chewing gum while on TV. I, I have no problem Let with it. Let me tell you something. When I was in elementary school, I yeah. wasn't allowed in classroom either. And you did it? No, I don't think I did it there. I got, well, maybe I did it once. And then you got knuckled? Yeah, and then that was the end of that, right? Polly, the friendly skies of United, remember that? Yeah. All right, the friendly skies of United, I know more. Rather, flying can be hazardous to your health. The Obama administration changed the hiring rules for the FAA, air traffic controllers, favoring, listen to this, favoring diversity over safety. It was determined that the workforce was too white. So Obama FAA scrapped the old hiring standards, prioritizing one's ethnicity over experience and skill sets. So I ask you, Paul, and you folks out there, whatever happened to hiring the best and the brightest? Is that a thing of the past now, Paul? I mean, that's always been my theory. You know, if you, if you uh, focus on what you need to do the job, look at the best candidates that are out there and hire the best possible candidate, you can't lose. Do we do but that? In, but in, in this environment, uh, this kind of environment, um, you know, they don't measure you on performance. They measure you on the percentage of, their, of what an ethnicity, how many men, how many women. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the measuring stick. And that's, that gets back to, you know, it, it may seem a little bit different, but to me that's exactly the issue that, that comes up when they talk about, um, uh, let's see. So the, the left will continually say things like, uh, well, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, Save that for an, for another segment. Let me ask you this, Paul. What is it the purpose of government to protect the rights of its citizenry to make sure they're not in harm's way? What kind of administration would put the safety of people behind diversity and social engineering? Think about that, Paul. That, well, that, that's 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 a very serious serious misstep. So I, I think that it's it, it's a it's a, a tribute to the attitudes that we want to have a diverse workforce to, to use diversity in the calculation. But to make it a priority, a, a first priority, is a, I think is foolish. Would you go to a, a neurosurgeon that got their degree as a consequence of diversity? Or do you want to go to a neurosurgeon that's by far the best of the brightest. I, I want somebody who has a, under fire. A, has a reputation for doing very Forget good the work. the reputation. Has the qualifications, has the skill set. Right. Well, well, you know, it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole Harvard education argument that I've made in the past. Think about this. You get a Harvard education. Yes. You're supposedly better than somebody that has a Northeastern University education. No, you just better network, Paul. Right. But, but it, it's gotten to the point where they only consider the credentials and not the person. And that, I think, is a, a similar it's dynamic. Gone to, it's, it's gone to an insanity, Paul. I never hear, by the way, folks, is 781-780-9460. Uh, so give us a buzz on this. This is a serious issue, folks. We're talking about jeopardizing the citizens of the United States of America over the fact that they want to have a more diverse Right. Air traffic controller set, and that's ridiculous. And make no mistake about it, the the CNN types, the MSNBC types, are are that are listening tonight. Um, the first thing that they're saying is that you're a racist because you. Well, how am I a racist, Paul? Paul, they fly on corporate jets of their own. They don't fly the public airways like the rest of us do. You get my point? Yep. So then they're, they're not subject. Oh, I suppose they are because you know they're also caught with the air traffic control. Paul, they actually, this is, this is an unbelievable, they did a profile. There's a profile that you have to fit. And if you've been unemployed, you go to the front of the line. If you did not do well at high school science programs, you go to the front of the line. Isn't there an insanity there in that type of reasoning and thinking? Absolutely. 
All right, then. So is that something? I mean, you know, why is why didn't the press pick up? It's coming out now, you know, Paul. Why hasn't the press picked up? That is dangerous. There is no excuse for that. Uh, it, it's dangerous, and um, you know there are opportunities to take advantage of the, you know, or, or to move in the direction of making, di creating diversity oppor opportunities for the, a diverse population. But you don't do it in such a a, 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 a um, here's what sa a safety related me. issue. Do like certain that. ethnicities and subgroups? gravitate to certain activities more so than others. Say that again? Are there certain subgroups, certain ethnicities, certain diverse populations that tend to gravitate to a particular exercise, human exercise, more so than other groups? You mean like the Irish being cops, that type of thing? Very good, Paul. Yeah. Or the Italian being bricklayers. Right. Or the folks from Nova Scotia being Finnish carpenters. Okay? I mean... Do you find that there are cultures, whatever the reason is, that certain groups are overrepresented in certain activities? Yeah, absolutely. It happens a lot. Is, is, that, is that because of racism? Is that because of exclusion? Or is that because it's a natural tendency, because of cultural factors or whatever? Yeah, I think that's, that's it. Is there anything wrong with that? Um, no, I don't think there is. And the attempts to try to undermine that natural order, if you will, is what do they call it? Balkanization, where you end up getting yeah. everybody's, you know, in the in the attempt to make it uh, soup mm -hmm. when it should be a salad, like you like to put it, you know. How many East Central Europeans do you see in the NBA? A lot. You do? What did you say, Central European? I said, how many East Central Europeans do you see playing in the NBA? There's a lot. 10%, really? I would think. Really? Well, you know, like... Um, I'm being facetious. What I'm saying is, how many folks who are native of Europe play in the NBA? That about, ancestry goes to Europe. About 10%. That means 90% of the players in the NBA are non-European. Yes. Okay. Is that the breakdown of the, of the population of the United States? No, it's not. So it's, it's, it's misrepresentation, isn't it? Right. Is there any affirmative action there? No, not, it, not it, should there be. And it's all based on talent and skill. And Thank you very much. Because at the end of the day, it's all about winning, right? And in order to win, you well, have to have the best. It, well, so why is sports fine all about winning, but corporate America, being a doctor or other things, is not? How come all of a sudden the spigot shuts off on those things that are important, just as important? How come so, we don't have... I mean. We Making actually, very valid points. I can't, I can't, well, I can't argue you. You're right. You know, well, we got to start talking about it because we have stayed away from talking about the real issues. And this air traffic controller situation really got to me. And it's just developing. Folks, you know, here at Frankly Speaking, we're pretty much ahead of the curve. Yes, You're well we aware of that. Yeah. Uh, anyways, the, we have a call, call. Let's get right to it. Hi, Carla. How are you? Hello? We do or we don't have that phone call? We do? Hi, how are you? Hello? Well? Good sign. Well, okay, well, yeah. maybe they'll call back. Hello? Well, give us a call back because, uh, all right. We had a uh, council meeting, or uh, there was a council meeting. We, oh, well, let me put it this way the mayor has submitted the 2019 fiscal budget, correct? Uh, let, let me put that up because I'm just going to go down some of the fact sheets here. It's uh, rounded off to $320 million. That's Lynn's total budget. School spending fully funded. I put a question mark there because they never told us how much it is. So how do you know whether it's fully funded or not? We, don't have, we have no dollar amount on it, correct? Why is that, Paul? Because they don't know how many students they're going to be catching in the fall. Post facto, correct? Um, I don't know that that's why they haven't given it to you, but um, it would does that make sense to you, that they have no idea what the real budget's going to be because they don't know what the student body's going to be in the fall? Well, I mean, having zero idea, they, they would at least have an idea of at a minimum it would be. But right? they've been getting three to 400 per year right. consistently, right? So even if they use that effect, if they pump up higher than that, that's going to affect the budget negatively and put it out of whack, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Then they say that the health care, and you're big on this one, $47.3 for health care costs. Is that conservative? That, that seems about right to you? That's 
that, that can't be right. It's health care and pension, I would think, is all in that number. So you're saying that's a combination pizza there? I would, think, I would say so, yes. All right. Now, here's but it's the, still a, 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 a that's a big figure. It's more than it's like fifteen percent of the budget. Yeah, you're is right. Go, is going to uh, non-service oriented stuff, which is what you've been arguing about for a long, long time now. Well, I'm, I'm arguing about it. I mean, the, 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 that's the deal we make with these people. So that's what that's the deal that they get. The, the fact of the matter is, it is growing to a point where you know, at some point, it's, it's going to be difficult to deliver. Okay. Now, on top of it, they throw in a little caveat. They say, oh, by the way, we can pick up, possibly pick up 20 new firemen through FEMA. And the way that works, and we're going to get to that in a second. Now, I'm going to ask you a simple question. You and you folks out there. The mayor says that the budget is balanced. Is it? Well, is it or isn't it? I mean, last week you is were telling it me it was $7 million out of balance. I ask you the question. Do you believe that the budget is balanced? Based on the fact that they're moving the budget discussion forward, yes. So you say the budget is balanced. I yeah. say there's going to be surprises. And the surprise is going to be that the budget is going to be greater, expenditures are going to be greater than they are okay, telling so, us. So, so and, and the, the, the distinction that you have to make is the budget that's going to be submitted must be balanced. That's not to say that expenditures down the line will not exceed what their expectations were. Well, and that Father, that's, just, that's just faulty bookkeeping. That's faulty budgeting, and that's disingenuous. I'll give you that. Yeah. So why turn so, around so, and say so, we have a balanced but, budget but, when everybody knows it's not balanced? But what, but I, and I guess we need to really get somebody to help us to understand what that whole issue was where uh, now we're, because we got the $14 million that was supposed to help us balance the budget for the next two years. Mm -hmm. This year not being the predicated first. predicated on a $7 million deficit they just found. It, it, so now there's an additional $7 million deficit on top of all of that. Supposedly. So how did, so how did they um, fix that? I have no idea. And I'd like to really know that. that, well, that no, one, th you know, no one's coming on this show to tell us. They, they don't come on this show to try to answer any questions. So maybe we'll We've get been asking. Maybe we'll ask. Maybe Darren will be back next week well, and maybe. we can ask him. So now they have a possible 20 firefighters, which everybody says, uh, you know, that there's a good, there's a bad, and an ugly to steal from Clint Eastwood. You know, an old Spaghetti Western. So let's throw that up there. The good is the chief archer applied for a safer grant from FEMA that will pay for most, you see the word most, right. of the cost of firefighter salary for three years. Not all, but most. That's the good. Here's the bad. After three years, guess who's going to pick up the tab? Right. The Lynn taxpayers, right? Ad infinitum. Here's the ugly. You can't fire them. Once you hire them, that's it. You're stuck. So well, you can you, you can lay them off. No, you, you cannot. That's part of the cabinet. You cannot. The firefighters cannot be terminated at the end of the 36 month program. Cannot be. That's the ugly part. Ever? Well, wow, that's a different issue. So, in other words, there. So, the, the the string attached to it is we'll we'll pay for most of it for three years, but you have to pay for the rest of the. So my, why Forever. We, so what thereafter. we need to do is hire people that are further in age so we don't have the commitment for as long a period of time. Well, that's part of it. It's a good point. But it's also going to cost you more. Why is that? Well, if they have more experience, are you talking about age and experience? I don't think um, experience comes into play with firefighters. Okay. It, it's, it's all about seniority. But, but let's, let's talk about this in real terms, Paul. 20 firefighters... Would you say that with fringe benefits and everything thrown in his salary, we're talking somewhere around $100,000 per head? Um, is that high? Or is that reasonable? Entry level, if I am in, I would say it's probably but, more but like let's 70. Let's average it out for entry and long term. I would say it's closer to 80 or 75. Right, I'll, give you, I'll give you 80. All right. All right. That's $1.2 million. Right? Forever. We're, we're, we're bonding out bonding out, because they consider bonding okay. Bonding is nothing more than borrowing money, right? Going into debt. Right. Okay. And it should be for long-term purposes. And we borrowing when our interest rate is not that good because we've been downgraded, correct? We're considered risky, therefore we have to pay more to borrow money. Would you agree to that? Um, double A-B? I mean, double B-A? Well, you know... It's a, it's, a, it's a continuum. So if, so, you, if you're, when you say we're, 
we're more risky. I would agree that we're more risky than somebody who has a higher rating. But that doesn't mean we are so risky that it's a well, bad investment. we have to investment. pay more for money, Paul. We have to pay more for money. Right. Net bottom line. We, we pay more for money because we're, not con we're considered a risk. Right. All right. Now, in the discussion here that no one's talking about, is five, you talked about last week about $5.8 million going to putting a new roof. Do, doing all the work at the Hood School, is it? Yeah. yeah. And we'll get into that because we're going to go to break. Our number here is 781-780-9460. Give us a buzz. We'll be right back. You've always protected me. Every day of my life. There you go. Thanks, Dad. I'm older now, but I still need you. Prescription pain pills, heroin. I know kids are getting addicted and people are dying. Can you still protect me? You can protect your teen. Teens who talk to their parents about opioids are less likely to misuse them. Find out what you can say. I was 18 years old. I had it made. Until I went to a college party and I thought I was immune to temptation. That's when reality struck. Quite literally. If you choose to slowly end your liver, don't let it be your life that ends early. Be responsible. Last week, Paul, you mentioned that $5.8 million that is proposed to renovate uh, or rehab uh, Hood School, elementary school, and they were going to go out and bond the money. You said, at that, and, and we were going to get reimbursed up to, up to 80%. You said that they, they'll bond out and borrow the whole amount, then chase the money. Is that what you said? Uh, I didn't quite say it like that, but, I'll, but I, what I will do to clarify is that that's how the state operates. So if you, if if you're, if they're going to give you 80 percent, let's just call it a six million dollar deal. If they're going to give you 4.8 million dollars, um, you have to bond the whole six, knowing that you'll be getting 4.8 from the state, and it, that you'll have to um, manage the other. The, you'll have to manage the rest of the debt with your receipts. Okay. So in effect, what I said is exactly what you just said. In other words, you're going to. But you don't have to chase the bar. They're gonna, obligated to pay. You don't have to chase them for it. Yeah, but what you're doing is you're borrowing the full amount. Yes. On the predicate that you're supposed to get 80% back, which sometimes doesn't happen. Well, how much you get back will be established while the bond process is going on. That's right. But the point of the matter is you're not going to get 100%. The city's going to be on the hook for $1.2 million. At least, yeah. Okay? Yeah. So you got $1.2 million there. You got another $1.2 in... Firefighters. Take a step so back. Take, a, take a deep breath. Too, take a deep ahead. breath because you got a, a difference between operational costs and uh, debt servicing costs. Debt servicing costs, um, you know, you got to pay 1.2 million plus interest over 20 or 30 years. The 1.2 um, million that you're paying for the firefighters has to come out of it will come out of the grant, and it'll all be paid out the same year. Whether it comes out and out years. But, the, but it is kind of an apples to oranges kind of comparison. You know? If you want, but, but, but that's, that's what bookkeeping gimmicks. The net bottom line is, is that you're adding $2.4 million to operating expenses no matter how you cut no. it. You're not? No, you're adding $1.2 million to operating expenses for and? the fire department. Yeah. Which is, which is covered by a $1.2 million grant, right? No. Or it's covered by almost $1.2 million grant. No, what I'm FEMA, saying to you right? is once, once the three-year period is over, we have to pick up the full cost. The okay, so when you're talking year four. I'm talking year one. In year one, it costs $1.2 million and is a, essentially a $1.2 million grant that's going to fund that. Supposedly. In, up to, in yeah. addition to that, yeah. there's a $5.8 million bond issue that's used to do the work on the property and that property will be amortized the cost of that will be amortized over 20 or 30 years so the actual cost on an annual basis will be based on 
the whole 5.8 million, the interest rate, and the, the time, and then the reimbursement will be about 80% from the state and the rest well, of the Well, I realize all that, Paul, but nevertheless, it's a cost to the city that wouldn't be there. Right. You have to pay it back. And you have to pay it back with interest, which means you're paying back more than you're actually borrowing. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a ne positive, it's a negative. No, I'm just, I'm just saying that if you want, if you, to me, the operating cost associated with the $5.8 million is the annual debt service. It's not the 1.2 or the 6, 5.8, whatever it is. What we're talking about right here, the way politicians view things, is exactly why we're $21 trillion in the hole. Right. As a nation, okay? No, yeah, I know. Okay, that's exactly the way it is. Now, how's this one, Paul? Has the item gone to pot? <laughs> you like that? Apparently, there's a move to put a pot parlor in the item building, and some people are fighting it left and right, while others are singing its laurels. Now, I don't know if these facts are correct, but let's see if we can get it up there. Has the item gone to pot? Apparently, they're claiming that every time you, you know, the average sale is $50 a pop when someone goes in there, right? That's what they're saying. And then they're saying that generates about $20 million a year. And from that, they project that the city land will be the recipient of about $600,000 or 3%. My question is, how do they administer this, and where do they come up with this 3 percent I mean, is it going to be a tax over and above, or what? Or is it a direct tax from the city? How do they figure this one out? So, all I know is how it worked with the, uh, the medical marijuana dispensary. Mm -hmm. We had a potential tenant that was going to be taking the bowling alley over. I think a lot of people know that, but nevertheless. So, the, so the, the idea was you submitted a proposal to the city, and you said this is what we would be willing to give you out of our gross receipts and what we would do for the community and all these types of things. And so that's, that's going to that come from the, the, the owner, the licensee, is going to come up and say, I'm going to give you 3% of my gross. And they, and they get it in exchange for those terms and conditions. They I get a you. host agreement, okay. which allows them to actually get the proper So they're going to come up with a figure. They're going to say, we're going to give you 3% of our gross sales. Yes. That's basically what they're right. saying. All right, so that's the way the fuzzy gonna... math is when you start talking about how much will they actually generate in revenue because nobody really knows that. That's right. It's and and so if you have one and it generates twenty million, it doesn't mean when you have two you get forty million. It means oh, exactly. You know, it means you you probably diminishing have... returns. Yeah. However, as much as I am opposed to having these, I think it's a it's a, a net negative for society overall. I'm for the item building being a location if they're going to do it because it's going to generate traffic in an area that definitely needs traffic. It's got a constituency already built in, the art community. It will probably stimulate more ridership on the train, you know, because downtown. So it has a positive business-wise. It makes sense. However, Paul, and folks out there, I think that we have to make Silsby Street, not, not Silsby, Mount Vernon, right? It's Mount yep. Vernon. A two-way street. It makes no sense for it to be a one-way street. It kills traffic. That, that actually, I would like to see that. Um, and let me just uh, throw in another piece of this, because I think you're, you're right about this generating uh, yeah. you know, action in the downtown. Um, so there's two medical marijuana dispensaries that are ostensibly going to be set up, and there's going to be another six that are going to be doing recreational, right? Right. So, that, so that's eight. The, the need for eight facilities to do it. Those eight facilities, ho hopefully you find eight empty buildings and you put them in these buildings, right? If not, they're going into existing properties and the people that are in there are moving to other places and so forth. But, you, but just think about it. So it's not like adding a, a dry cleaner to the downtown because it needs a dry cleaner. It's, and, and that helps, certainly. This is a, a, a groundswell of new business opportunities in the city of Lynn. Forget about the individuals who are going to benefit from it. Think about the, as you put it, you know, the, the, um, the velocity of money and how that comes into the situation. From the, out of town. Potentially, as yeah. well as internally. But, it, you know, it so will generate a lot of activity. So if they come in from out of town, they light up downtown Lynn, they add a little character. It's, you know, you got raw art down there. You have some really good things happening in downtown Lynn, right? Right. Who, that, that's ready to mature. If you package that all together and you allow for circular traffic 
on Mount Vernon Street. You come from many different directions. I think the city's going to benefit significantly from this as much as I think... It, look, if you're going to have it, you might as well utilize it properly. Look for its upside. Right. So I think it could be a very good thing. And it makes better sense to me to put it in an area that is not... Um, you know, next to somebody's house or no, next it's to a perfect. School. Right. It's right in a commercial area, and the clientele. You know, one of the arguments they say, well, how many people living in a, in condos or apartment houses want to have a dispensary? I say most of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, what kind of crazy stuff is that? Uh, Paul, you've been big on perks, and you know, you call it perks. You can call it benefits, whatever you want. If we can throw that up, Pedro. And my question is, should elected officials, public servants, government employees receive perks in the first place? And my example is, should the mayor of the city of Lynn be offered an automobile for their private use 24-7 because they got elected to be mayor? Yes. Why? Because their job is not just sitting in the, mayor, the corner office in City Hall uh, Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. Can't they use their own car for that, Paul? They can. And get reimbursed? Well, they could, I guess. Suppose yeah, so it's why six do to we one have to provide dozen. a car then? Well, was that always the case? I don't believe so. I think Pat McManus was the first one that had that, and that may be true. Um, you know, and whether or not it's they they actually provide you with the car or whether they reimburse you for the money so that you can do it. I think it's six to one, half a dozen of another. The, the, it, well, let me ask this: Does the governor have his own private car from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Um, no. No, but, the, but he's uh, driven everywhere, essentially in a limousine. During his working time, right, he has a car available for him to do state business. 24-7. Yes. Uh, so he's working 24-7. As the President of the United States says the same. Right. We understand that. I remember Speaker Kaverian in my old days when we used to play a little, little cards. And listen, this is a true story, folks. He and I used to kitty. And he liked it because I used to be in a lot of pots, so I added more to the kitty, and he'd just sit back and split the kitty at the end of the night with me and giggle. I had to pick someone up at the airport who happened to be playing at my house at the time. And I said, listen, I'll be right back. i got to go pick someone up at the airport. He goes, no, 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 take my car. That's what we're talking about. He says, take my car. So I get this big, big, huge Lincoln, and it has, says, speaker on the number plate, speaker one. So as I'm driving... To Logan, oh, I get pulled over, and they're going to arrest me for stealing the speaker's car. He called in that the car was stolen. He did? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, after they giggled and laughed, I got an escort to and, for, you know, quickly to and back. I want to bring this story up because <laughs> his plate, he had a speaker plate. When you look at uh, the state reps... They have rep they have, a, they have a choice. They don't have to have the plate. Well, Some of them do, some of them don't. Well, I mean, the point is, that's the perk. That makes sense to me. But right. they don't give them a car. Right. So in a time of austerity, wouldn't it be a good idea? No. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I ask can, you. Do can, you can, think... Can I just say, you, yeah. can I just say that at, at, at the executive level, I would say that they need to be able to get in and about 24-7. Think about... The, well, the, have a, think have about a, the governor when we had all those crazy snowstorms right after he got elected. He needed to be getting to places to, to, you know, to deal with the, the MEMA stuff and to deal with you know, how they were going to uh, central command and control. He needs to be re ready at all times. And I'll tell you another thing. Shortly after Judy Kennedy became the mayor in Lynn, you'll recall that we had a building collapse where we put out vehicles and two of our drivers were trapped in the building. All right. I don't like that. And it was in the middle of a, of a snowstorm. We had maybe eight, ten inches of snow on the ground, and the, and the collapsing or the snow just blanketed the whole city, and what happened happened. But Judy needed to be brought to the scene. I got she we needed go to, to have, break, She needed to have access to transportation. Okay. We'll discuss that when we get back from my break.
49 million Americans struggle to put food on the table. More than one in five children are at risk of hunger. Among African Americans and Latinos, it's one in three. 40% of food is thrown out in the U.S. every year, or about $165 billion worth. All of this uneaten food could feed 25 million Americans. If you or someone you know is struggling with hunger, please visit My Brother's Table at 98 Willow Street. And we're percolating to benefits and perks. Paul, I think the genesis of this whole thing had to do with state troopers or something in effect? Yeah, I mean, so the, there was a big state trooper scandal, what they were stealing over time and all that kind of stuff. We all, I think everybody's uh, heard about that by now. Um, but since then, you know, upon further review, uh, it's been discovered that some of the uh, perks, I don't mean, I don't mean company cars or anything like that. I'm just talking about like stipends that they get for this and that and the other thing. Um, we're not properly uh, taxed. Um, so the, 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 way the, the way that the troopers were handling it, and by the way, it used to happen here in it, Lynn. I think it may still, I don't know for sure, but the, the bottom line is the federal government wants their Social Security tax, they want their FICA, they want the federal tax, yep. the state wants the income tax. All that stuff has to be collected on anything that's considered income. And if something is truly considered, should be considered income, and the, and the IRS doesn't get its mitts on it, they get a little upset. And they're getting upset now because they come to find out there were some, all these benefits that were paid to state troopers, and they just, and they, they weren't being taxed at all. And, and, and I think, and this gets back to um, something that happened when I was on the city council. There were, there were two things that happened. One was a, a matter when, um, I don't know where it came from, but the, the, the uh, controller's office was coming out and saying that they needed to recategorize how we were getting, because we, we got a car allowance or some type of allowance. It was like a $420, yeah, I remember that, yeah. $400 or $300, I don't know what it was. It was some amount we got every month, <laughs> no, $700, and it wasn't being handled properly. We were, get, we were forced to pay income tax on it, but it wasn't hand, being handled the right kind of way. The other thing, and this is, you know, this is the thing that I think lo localities have to, uh, are going to be forced to come to address yeah. more fully, and that is, for example, the fire department trading hours with other people. Um, you know, you work for me, and I'll cover for you another time. What happens when they do that is, so Joe works for Jim. Jim doesn't, Jim actually gets paid, but Joe does the work. Yeah. So there are some issues with that because if some if if Joe gets hurt on the job, he wasn't really even supposed to be there, you know. And then and then if Joe doesn't cover for but Jim, that's and a management then, issue, isn't it, Paul? It, it management absolutely. should take care of that. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. And and by the way, I raised this years ago on the uh, committee, and uh, it was addressed. At least they told yeah, me it was. Addressed. And it should be, you know, for the reasons you talk about. I want to get into a fellow named. Robert F. Kennedy, and if we could throw that up. Chris Matthews of Tingle Up My Leg fame, <laughs> in his book, Bobby Kennedy, A Raging Spirit, quoted Bobby Kennedy as saying that the reason why he, Bobby Kennedy, was running for president was because I'm concerned that this country is on a perilous course. That was said 50 years ago. It is still being said today by a crop of 220 presidential hopefuls. Jim Carrigan of American Dream fame is still dreaming about Camelot 50 years later. He, Bobby Kennedy, was called ruthless, says Carrigan, but he wasn't. He was very aggressive on behalf of justice. Doesn't that sound familiar? Carrigan believes Bobby Kennedy would have pulled troops out of Vietnam. Nixon did. And that Bobby Kennedy would have promoted policies aimed at ending poverty. LBA tried and failed, as has every president since. That's because they don't really want to end poverty. That's right. Senator Markey says, Bobby Kennedy is the greatest president we never had. Well, we'll never know. I wasn't a fan. Um, 
he was a little bit too young to, uh, I was only nine years old when he was assassinated. Um, his, his name really, along with his brother, Jack was, you know. Yeah, well, we mythologize a right. lot. That's the whole point. But it's interesting, though, and, you know, you, you look at, we, we talk today about John Kennedy's, his, his, his uh, ideology was more conservative than the Democrat Party, would you say? By far. So, in other words, that he would not even be allowed in the Democrat Party today? Not as it's now constituted. Right. At the same time, his brother, Ted, is called the... The, the lion, the liberal lion, or something, right? So, mm -hmm. so he have two brothers that were essentially they were both Democrats, but they were both very different in their philosophy. I don't right? believe so, Paul. I believe that the ultimate goal for both of them and the vehicle at the time was they, their interest was power, right? And whatever brought them to power. So I'm saying Jack Kennedy. You know, when people say if he were alive today, he'd be a conservative. No, if he were alive today, he'd be a left winger because all he would be interested in was power. That's a good point. You know? So I guess what I was going with that is if, if, if Ted Kennedy was, you know, a, a, a typical leftist liberal type and his brother John was a typical conservative, where does Robert fit in all that? And what you're saying is that they, he would have done, he'd do the same thing, right? Just kind of take the easy road to power, that kind of thing? Sure. They, they, they were trying to figure out what's the coalition, how do I do the math to get elected? That's all they're interested okay, in. Okay, so, so without getting too deep into conspiracy theories, I mm. believe that, um, you know, it wasn't just a crazy man that shot John Kennedy, it wasn't just a crazy man that shot Robert Kennedy, and it wasn't just a crazy man who shot um, uh, Martin Luther King. Similarly... So do you think that they were all, they were all assassinated by the same... People, if that cadre of individuals, you yeah. mean, otherwise known as the, the deep state. Right. Who knows? But this is what I do know. That there was no Russian collusion in the Trump campaign. You see? <laughs> so, I mean, now it's all coming out. that they, Listen to this one, folks. Talk about lack of transparency. I'm telling you, the Obama administration cut deals with Iran that they weren't supposed to cut where they were allowing the banking system to be used surreptitiously without the knowledge of Congress. How do you like that one? They tried, but you know what was really cool I, when I was reading about that is the banks refused to, to, to play along because they would have ended up being held responsible for it if it got where it got Paul, out. Paul, they threw a CIA agent in the can for 23 months. Brennan didn't like him. He said, charge him with espionage. He said, but he didn't commit espionage. He said, who cares? Let right. him prove he didn't. So this is the way they operate. Right. And, you know, people say, well... They pleaded guilty. You know, four people pleaded guilty. You know why they plead guilty, Paul? Because they throw the book at them. They'll put them away forever and a day. Right. They bankrupt you. And so you plead guilty to a lesser charge. You know. No, I know. It, it, it's Even despicable. though you're not guilty. That happened to Flynn. Right. General Flynn. So, I don't know. You know, President Madison, if we can throw this up, he said, and this is from an old show, he said that men are no angels. Therefore... We must have checks and balances built into the Constitution. Those checks and balances were neglected something fierce in the last eight years. That's right, it could, because there's, um, you know, the, the fourth estate was became part of the problem. They 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 were in cahoots with the other three estates. You know, yeah. you got the executives and Congress and in the Supreme Court. The fourth estate is the news, right? The news media, and they protected the, you know, the behaviors of the Obama administration. And we talked about it for eight years ad nauseum. Nobody but it's wanted out to listen. Now. Nobody would listen. And you know what they did? O Obama knew this, and all of his people knew this. If they, if, with the protection of the media, they could run out the clock and get all their things through, and then, you know. Any, any efforts to go after Obama today. First of all, they, they thought Clinton was going to be in there, so nobody would bother them. But the fact that they, that, that didn't play out, they're, they're, out, of the, they're out of the game. The, the rules were set. They, the things were done. And, you know, I don't think that they, they, they believe, that they, I don't think any of them believe they're ever going to jail. And sometimes I, I, I worry that that's, in fact, the case. A lot of them should go to jail. As you All the way up the line, maybe to the very top. Of course. As we speak now, the Bilderbergers, if you folks know who they are, are meeting in Italy. Yeah. These are the folks who run the world. Right. Talk about deep state. Right. They pull the, they pull the strings behind For the everybody. scenes. everybody. 
George Soros types, right? Well, this is what gets me. They talk about collusion and Russian interference into our election system. Do people out there understand that George Soros owns a big chunk of the electronic voting machines and tabulating machines that take place in this country? Huh? He controls them. He, he has more of an influence on elections than anybody. Yeah, of course he does. Mm -hmm. But Not just because of these tabulation but machines. But he's on the side. Of, he's on his own side. He's doing it all for his own interest, self-interest. Well, his philosophy, his ideology. Right. He's an ideologue. He's Let an, me ask he, this. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that he's an ideologue. I, I think he, he does everything because if he, can, if he can move the pieces around the chessboard the way he wants them, he can, take, um, he can make economic moves, make trades. I mean, he did this back in the 90s. Do you think 90s. he's interested in money for himself, or do you think he's interested in money for the power to be able to change? Money for the power. Okay. So... Here is, here is the funny thing. We were going to ask a poll question, and fundamentally what it was, was, are unions obsolete? Now, the reason why I have that there, you see that? Are unions obsolete? Our number here is 781-780-9460, right? Right. I'm going to argue that one of the reasons why I thought of that was the Air Traffic Controllers Union was brought up in a suit because they claim the union has been captured by leftist ideology who are imposing their will on what happened. They were in favor of the diversity, they, and they weigh it, and they raise a bunch of money to influence voting in Congress, okay? Right. So if you take a look at that and you start extrapolating, aren't unions today pretty much speak one voice, which is basically left and far left? Yeah, and you know, my my beef um, has always been, you know, we always talk about the uh, the organized minority in the city of Lynn, and I think this is a pretty fair statement. Uh, the fire department kind of runs the city because they either they will either work very hard to get you in or very hard to get you out, and they are, and they stand there waiting for their reward every time they get you in and. Um, you know, and when they get so, there. on that predicate, are they going to get the twenty? If the twenty officers, FEMA decides to fund it, you think they're going to take it? Absolutely, will. Of course, they are. Is that in the best interest of the city of Lynn? Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember when I was on the council, uh, Chip Clancy saying to me, uh, saying that uh, or there was some type of similar kind of deal where you get three years, and then it, it, he wouldn't. He wouldn't bite. He wasn't going to do it because he didn't know where he was going to get the money in year four. Should we do it? Um, under the current circumstances where we are so uh, deep in the hole, we're talking $7 million deficit, $15 million deficit. We owe the state $14 million. We've got all these issues going on. I would say no. What about putting a new roof on Hood School? Um, I need more information. I, I would say there you, ha you have to make sure that the school is the safe point, for the kids. And, and what about the mayor having a car? See, I'm saying... That symbolically, you have to say no to things. Yeah, you I have agree. to start saying no to things because I just paid fifteen hundred and seven dollars and fourteen cents yesterday to the city of Lynn, which is substantially higher than I paid last year. Okay, that's not counting the fact that I'm going to have to pay a trash fee in a couple of weeks, and if I don't go down to city hall, remember to go to city hall, folks, if you're senior like I am. I'm not going to get my rebate. I have to chase my own money. Right. Okay? So this is what's happening, Paul. And you can't or we can't as a city persist with this type of and, voodoo and I, economics. And I agree with the symbolism, um, but I want substance. I want, a, I want substantial effort to, to reduce the cost. I don't want, it, I don't want symbolic stuff. Right, if, if, you take away, if you take away We're the mayor's... Call it, Paul. Oh, okay. Carla, how are you? Good evening. Uh, hello, is this me? Hi, how are you? Hey, Joe, this is Tim calling. How are you, Tim? Um, I'm feeling okay. My voice is tough. <laughs> I was just wondering how many people in the fire department will retire in the next three years? I haven't got a will clue. These, will he these people be used just to just administer not to him? We don't have that many fires anymore, Joe. Yeah. Uh, no, my voice won't handle much more, but it's good to be back on air. Thank you. 
Do you think? Are you still there? No. Yeah. Do you th do you think that the under the present circumstances, the city of Lynn should avail themselves of that grant from FEMA? Absolutely. You think? We Absolutely. Okay. If there are going to be that many retirees in the next three years, or close to it. So, so you know, and, and well, that's a good point. And, and I think that you know, it really isn't a fair statement to say equivocally either yes or no on this with only that for information. You need to do on, you do need to understand, you know, the attrition and things like that. So if, but he, you're, but replacing, also, if you're replacing your retirees, as he points out, three years down, so if we're going to be losing 20 firemen in a three-year period of time, then he's absolutely correct. We, right. we should avail ourselves of it, right? right. Actually, it's cost savings. Right. The quite, but, but I would I would be careful of that because you may have we may have twenty guys come and do for retirement and they will likely take it and so forth. But you also have to consider the fact that as somebody retires, they may see it as an opportunity to add another guy on top of it. it it's it, always dangerous. Yeah. Is is the is the city position that we're going to take these guys on now? And we are going. We are not going to replace the next twenty guys that go out. That's up. what if has to take, be explained. If you take that position, I'm all for it. We're going to take a break on that position and be back with another position. Three hundred and fifty million people worldwide suffer from depression. While this may come as a shock, what many people don't seem to realize is that depression comes in various forms and is experienced differently in everyone. There is one death by suicide every 12.3 minutes, and two out of three people with depression do not actively seek nor receive proper treatment. So let's change that. You are not alone. Seek help today. Welcome to Lynn Community Television, your local media center. Here, we have great resources and staff to help create your own content. Hi, I'm Jim Carrigan, host of The American Dream. I'm also a member of Lynn Community TV, and I want to encourage everybody out there who's not a member of Lynn Community TV to join the group. We have a lot of fun down here. The studio is new, and it's in fabulous condition. Things provided to our members are state-of-the-art studio, video and audio equipment, editing space, and a full-on training session with a staff member been involved in access television for over 20 years. Our shows have gone out to tens of thousands of people in local communities and millions throughout the world. Come on down, learn how to use the equipment to promote whatever it is you're doing. For more information, please visit our website at www.lintv.org. Give us a call or come on down to the station at 181 Union Street in Lynn. The question is quite simple. Have unions or are unions obsolete? Now, you can weigh in on this, by the way, on Facebook, I'm told, uh, so they can let us know how they feel about that. And this is not to say that unions didn't have their place, right. but have we moved to a different place? So a couple things about that. First, I'd like just like to say that, um, you know, the, there are a bunch of rules about how you treat your employees, and there's... You know, for example, you give people sick time. Can I Because we have a caller. Okay. Caller, how are you? Sure. Uh, good. It. How are you doing? Fine. Hello. Yeah, just, You're on Frankly Speaking. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in on the, uh, on the fire department there. You know, it would be nice to have them. I'm sure they're down. But as you said, Joe, uh, as far as uh, we're in such financial difficulty, it's not, uh, it's not a wise thing. But uh, obviously... Better. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think that's kind of the point that I, I was trying to make, and that is, um, if you're if you're really digging out of a hole, and um, you know, I think uh, Tim said it as well. That, you know, the fires are way down. I mean, the the the, the technology, um, fire detectors, and all that kind of stuff. It's more about prevention now and and em emergency responses as opposed to fires. So. Um, 
In many respects, uh, firemen is not even the, uh, a, a, an accurate description of the job that they were asking them to do. You know, they're, they're more emergency, so you're saying emergency me responders, you know? Yeah, so, so question. So what does that mean? Does that mean you can work with a smaller force, a more efficient force? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, well, was that the point? Because I was trying to put my ear pads and I didn't quite get it. I, well, I think that they compared to say back in the seventies when yep. when this when the city was a tinderbox. <laughs> yeah, I would to say, say the least. Yeah, I would say that um, you know the, the, things are different, and, and the, the fire department can be doing a lot more things around prevention and so forth. And I'll and I'll just add this. I mean, we're actually uh, working with the the fire department right now to to help. Um, identify areas where we can help reduce the instances of unnecessary 911 calls. Now these are, if we can reduce the number of calls that are unnecessary at the same time as there is a, you know, no, no money to grow the budget, we, we, effective, we can have an effective outcome in that we, we won't leave ourselves unprotected. You Question. know what I'm saying? Do, does the fire department charge the insurance companies for being an ambulance service when they make? In some cases, yes, if, if so, where, when appropriate, yes. So the fire department can charge insurance companies for making medical emergency calls? Yes, I believe that's correct. That's interesting. I'd like to see what that, how much that generates. Yeah, I, I don't I'm know. sure that the folks who are uninsured it's a different issue. But what about if a senior citizen, which mostly would avail themselves of that, whether that's reimbursed by Medicare and federal government? Well, you know, um, that'd be interesting all to kind know. Of, all kinds of interesting rules around that. Um, we have a friend who um, called me because he needed help with his, uh, I think it was his mother-in-law or maybe, maybe uh, father-in-law. I don't mm -hmm. recall exactly. It was a while ago. Um, and he wanted, he just wanted to give, get them a ride. They needed, they were going to need help being, they would have to be carried into a vehicle and carried out and so forth because of the situation. Um, and so they called an ambulance and f first of all, the ambulance said $2,000 and then the insurance said, company said, well, we're not paying for it. So he called Gliss and we did it for $75. You know what I mean? Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, a lot of different things that you have to take into consideration, and there are other element, other ways to go instead of just you know hitting that nine one one and having the total response. By the way, when you hit nine one one, regardless of what the the nature of the call is, you get a, a fire engine, an ambulance, and a police cruiser all get all respond, whether it's a fire, whether it's a car accident, no matter what. Or Should that just be revisited? Sleep. Try to get the unions to go along with that. Well, so that was the issue. Right. Have the unions gotten to the point where what they're demanding or what they're asking for is really kind of productive? Right. Well, that was, you know, we started talking about the, the idea of whether unions are, are obsolete. One thing that I will tell you is that, as would anybody, every time a new contract comes up, I don't care what union it is, I don't care whether it's even an individual negotiating with their employer. You want to get more than you had, right? Everybody always wants to get more than they had. And I think that over the years, because of the, the profligate spending of mayors in the past, you know, I think that the deals that the public sector unions have in the city of Lynn are very good. Very good deals indeed. And they can't give them much more. Now it's like, so but I think it's time to let me, pull let, back. Me, let me ask you this. How many folks that work at Silicon Valley do you think are unionized? None. Exactly. So the whole economy that's moving toward technology and things like this, that means the unions are not necessarily anymore. It's a different entire workforce. If you're at 3.8 percent unemployment, which is the lowest it's been in my lifetime, right? That means there are actually more jobs in America today than there are people to fill the jobs. Consequently, you don't need a union because they're going to compete for labor and drive the costs up naturally. Am I right or wrong? Well, well I, in the, at the time, that's correct. You got to remember, though, that the, we do 
do have a hills and valleys kind of economy. Of course we do. So that it won't always be that way. But let me just say that when you talk about um, you know, the, the union effect and the, and, the, and the benefits to having them and so forth versus the way it was before, just to get back to your diversity um, segment that we did earlier in the show. You know, the recognition that somebody um, is the best for the job. Best and the brightest. Best and the brightest is lost in unions, too. Of course it is. They, you, in fact, you have they to, oppose the best and the brightest. Right. Who is in favor of the best and the brightest? Who's pushing that? Donald Trump, for one. Melania Trump is, isn't she? Yeah. I'm That's, pushing it. I want, yeah. I want the best and the brightest. So why is it that those folks that are pushing good things, and the results are right there, the great economy, great stock market, ISIS, who's... Have you heard of ISIS lately? No. Gone. They're going to be meeting within a week, Paul. Before we do our next show, the President of the United States is going to be meeting with North Korea. It hasn't been done. And we could conceivably end the Korean War finally and have a little peace and stability in the world. Right. He, the Europeans are going bonkers because he's telling them, by the way, folks, you're not going to get your free ride anymore. You pay your fair share of your own defense. Huh? I mean, it's really fascinating to me how people, particularly in this part of the country, don't recognize the great benefits that are happening with, you know, and it's happening in Europe, Paul, Eastern Europe and Central Europe. The Bilderbergers are going, they're flipping out. You know, the globalists are going bananas. So all of the stuff you folks are getting out there is because they want open borders. They don't believe in national states. You know? So they want to reorder things. And the rest of the country, the rest of the world say, wait a second, hold it, hold it. I like being Czechoslovakian. Or I like being a Slovenian. Or I like being a Hungarian, right? You know what the biggest obstacle to uh, globalization, though, is? It's, it's the U.S. Constitution. Why is it an obstacle to globalization? Explain that to me. Because that's the only, because we're the only ones that really has a, 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 a system that has far exceeded everybody else's. And because it's built on the Constitution, the only way that they can level the playing field and bring everybody up is to decimate the Constitution and, which and is essentially they, put us at a disadvantage. Which they spent a lot of effort last right. eight years trying to destroy and wipe right. out the Constitution. Namely, freedom of speech, which political correctness is gone, and they're working on the Second Amendment. And we are completely out of all kinds of seconds until next week. Have yourself a great, great week.